was born in in a little dorpie called Whitbank in 1980. And uh, I think I was always destined for other things. From a very young age, I I was I was very creative. I used to to love drawing. I loved music. Um, I loved fishing, and I loved fly fishing. You know, there was something quite special about it for me. I don't think you choose fly fishing. I think fly fishing chooses you. Very often, people people tell me, you know. It's amazing to them how creative fly fishermen are or fly fish fly fishing people are. You know, you'll be amazed how many writers, how many musicians, how many actors, how many uh, sculptors, how many bamboo rod builders, how many how many create how many people who happen to fly fish are also highly creative and and there's no accident there. When art and fishing meet, you get fly fishing. It's like, it's kind of like ballet. Ballet and fly fishing to me are one and the same thing. It's got to do with rhythm. It's got to do with movement. It's got to do with connection. All of those things. When I was 13 years old, I went to the Drakensberg Boys Choir School. And on the first day when I was there, I saw a, a boy practicing his fly casting on the field. I didn't really know what he was doing, but it just looked fascinating. It looked so beautiful, just seeing that line. And I was intrigued, so I walked up to him and I asked him, can you please teach me how to do this? And that's basically where, where fly fishing started for me. I just saw this thing and I just knew I have to do this. From a small age, I was just fascinated by fish, you know, and I'd always be nagging my mother to to take me to Whitbank Rod and Reel. And I used to buy car hooks for like five cents each or 10 cents each. And it was difficult not having anyone in the family who fished because I had to sort of figure it out for myself. Whenever we went on holiday, I would, if there was a piece of water, I'd, I'd go fish, you know, with a hand line or whatever the case was. But fly fishing was just a whole different thing for me. It's kind of been the leading motor through my whole life, actually. You know, it's, it's part of who I am. It's part of what I do. I'm not even a great fisherman, but that doesn't matter. I just love fly fishing. I think the thing that attracted me to fly fishing was the fact that it's a creative pursuit. That's what makes it different from other forms of fishing. If you look at the flies that one ties, if you look at the tackle you fish with, a lot of guys make their own tackle, you know, split cane rods, and I've got this like love affair with them. They're just fantastic. Even the way you present the fly, it's very creative in the way it gets done. So that kind of appealed to me. You know, the whole creative aspect of it. I find the tying flies extremely therapeutic. It's like the best therapy a man can get is just tying flies. You just disappear, you know. You just switch off from everything else and you just tie this fly. And you see the fly being fished when you tie it. I'm looking out the window and there's a pool and I know this afternoon this hopper is going to drift on that riffle right there and probably catch a nice yellow fish. So I started fishing and we would mostly go to Dahlstrom. We used to fish a guy's place called Trout, Trout Valley and that's where it started. But as I got older, I started getting very interested in stream fishing and when I moved to the Cape I could do that all the time and that just opened up a whole new world for me you know fishing fishing those streams was just beautiful and then in 2000 and I think it was 2018 
I fished the Bokong for the first time. And that, like, just, I don't know, just flipped my world upside down. The city is a mountain kingdom within the borders of South Africa. And what's kind of amazing about the place is that it's exactly that, a mountain kingdom. There are mountains everywhere. One of its major resources is water. There's so much water here, it rains a lot. So in the early 90s, the Lesotho government built this massive still water impoundment called Katsi Dam. And they dammed up a river called the Malibamatsu. And when they did this, they trapped a whole lot of indigenous yellowfish in this dam. Yellowfish basically are very similar to European barbel. In South Africa, we call them freshwater bonefish because that is what they are. It's like this turbocharged, crazy fish. Every spring and summer, these fish have to migrate upstream to go spawn. And there are two streams. There's the Maleba Matsu in the east and the Bokong in the west. And what happens is you have this mass migration of fish every single year. It's kind of like a salmon run, except the runs are good. You know, they're not dwindling. Every year, millions of fish are streaming into the system to come and spawn. Once they in and once they spawn, they stay there for the whole season. And then when it gets cold again, they move out. And the amazing thing about these fish is that they readily take a dry fly. This must rate as some of the best dry fly fishing on earth. It can be technical. You can have these fish eating tiny little dry flies and being super picky. Sometimes they, they just smash a hopper. Sometimes they're looking down and they don't want the dry. Um, but it's just an amazing place. It doesn't matter what you like, you can find it here. You slowly crouch to the end of this tail out and there's no one else around you. And you're sitting on these rocks and there's these fish rising about a rod length away from you. And you've crept up so softly, they don't know you're there. And you just pop a fly in there. And this fish comes up ever so softly. And you strike and all hell breaks loose. You see this yellow fish cartwheeling, <laughs> water splattering, that whole school of fish just... <laughs> it erupts. It's, it's like someone hoid a bomb into the river. And that's the amazing thing, you know, when you catch yellow fish, you always have silence and then utter chaos. It's a roller coaster. It's you're very quiet and, and it goes nuts. Dry fly fishing for yellow fish. Just something else, you know. The first fly I ever tied was something I called Goldie's Nymph. I used hair from our dog and I tied this thing in hand. And I didn't know if it would work or not. And we go to Dahlstrom and I tied onto my tippet 
and I cast it out, but I really needed to pee. So I just leave the rod lying there and I go pee behind this pine tree. I'll never forget it. And the next second, I just hear this reel going. And I sort of run and in mid run, I pack my tackle in and I grab the rod and I, you know, I'm into this fish and I, I catch this beautiful cockfish, like a, a two kilogram cockfish in full spawning colors, everything. And that was the thing that got me started because that's kind of where the kick is for me, catching a fish on, on the flies I tie. You know, in the beginning, my whole mission was to tie flies better and tie them more perfect. But the better the flies became, the less fish I kind of caught on them. I always aimed for my flies to look like flies in the magazine. And at some stage, I started devolving. I started tying simpler. Um, still neat. I mean, I, you know, it's probably a weakness of mine. is the fact that I, I tie neatly. But I kind of console myself with the fact that after a couple of fish, that fly will look like trash. And then it'll have the perfect look. I've always been attracted to sight fishing. I like seeing the fish, summing it up, and then casting a fly to the fish. And I like seeing how fish react to flies, you know? My whole process and the way I work has always been very functional. Most of the stuff I do is it's just from observation, from trying things out. You get some people who tie flies and, and their flies are very much based on theory. Mine aren't. I like going fish them and see what they do. If they don't do what I need them to do or want them to do, I change them until they do what I want them to do. I had this art teacher, his name was Darby Smuts. And, uh, he was teaching us about the Bauhaus movement and, and Louis Sullivan, the guy who invented the skyscraper. And he said the following words. He said, form follows function. You know, and I never forgot it. I listened to this oak talking and uh, I thought, you know, this oak's got a point. I can apply this to, to fly tying. And from that moment, my whole approach to this stuff changed. I wasn't just tying patterns or tying according to recipes. I was thinking about it. What did I want the thing to do? The other thing it also did, it simplified things for me. All of a sudden, I wasn't just trying to put a lot of stuff onto a hook because it looked cool. The stuff on the hook was there because it needed to be there. Every single element was considered. I wasn't just shooting blindly anymore. And then I realized how simple this stuff is. You know, when you think of it like that, there's actually not that much to know in fly tying, really. Um, there may be 12 different things to know and everything else is, is a variation on that. So the important thing is to get thinking about this stuff straight. And eventually I wrote a book about it too, The Feather Mechanic. And in it, I basically explain this whole concept of form and function in flight time. The whole thing is about that, based on that whole, that whole premise. I've been fishing with a, with a bamboo rod that was made by this old guy, Sage Portgieter probably the first bamboo rod builder in South Africa. His son, Gerard, let me use this rod. And uh, same thing, eh? He didn't have a lot of help in the beginning. He had to figure things out for himself. I look at this rod. This rod was built in 1995. I'm fishing this rod and it is beautiful. It's a spiritual experience. That's what it is. Casting it is just fun. And I'm, and I'm not being all esoteric and all like smoking my socks and then, 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 but that is what it is to me. And that's what fly time is to me. 
I like the fact that we can take some feathers and turn it into something that a fish is going to eat. This is not for everyone. Not everyone would be attracted to that. That, that is a crazy notion. Fly tying just calms me down. You know, I tie and I disappear. If, I, if I've had a period of high stress, I yearn for my vice. Sometimes we get so busy that we can't stop. So when you do something like fly tying or gardening or, I don't know, bonsai trees or whatever the case might be, those activities slow you down. They make you stop. We've got this notion that we have to be busy, that we have to be active, that we have to continually do things. Sometimes the best thing is not to do. I'm Gordon van der Spey and I, I fly fish. I'm intrigued by it. Always have been.